Hey folks, my name is Dave, and I lost like the first couple of slides, so I'm not sure <laughs> what happened there. So I'm just going to go wing the first part of this. Um, so let's see. We've got about, but you could not be more spread out. Interesting. <laughs> Towards the end of the day, you're like, yeah, I just want to be alone. I'm tired. I'm going to have find a corner and sit over here quietly. OK, well, uh, unfortunately for you, I like to be a little bit interactive. So um, I am going to ask you uh, every once in a while some information. And my purpose here today is to really help you understand what the different NoSQL options are for you and really help you understand uh, perhaps when you might use one versus another. And I'm going to stick to pretty much the more common NoSQL databases. And I come from. Uh, Previously, I was working until two months ago at a company called Redis Labs, so I can tell you um, a lot about uh, in-memory da NoSQL databases, but also um, uh, from experience working with um, you know, Cassandra and my, uh, MongoDB <coughs> and even Postgres. Uh, but um, so my goal here today is really to help you understand uh, the, the landscape of what's going on with the NoSQL databases and perhaps help you with you know, what you should use when. Um, OK. So uh, my first couple slides were uh, just simply going through the, the different databases. And for some reason, it's um, just completely gone. I think I might have just lost it in a save or something like that. But anyway, uh, how many of you have been using NoSQL databases for a while? Not that many of you, really. OK, so one, two, three, four, five, about five of you. OK. Um, how many of you have used an SQL database before? That's just about all of you. All right, very good. OK. So let's start from the beginning, where we go from using SQL to a NoSQL database. Let's just start there. OK. Um, why do you think NoSQL became a thing? OK, because it became a thing probably around 2010. It actually became a thing before that, but we started calling it NoSQL around 2010. Um, anybody want to guess? Yes. What's that? Performance? OK, very good. OK, I think these are both good answers. Um, so essentially what started happening is that when you're dealing with uh, performance in the cloud, oh, did you like what I did there? Um, you end up with greater, n larger number of things happening than you were used to, all right? Because you've got a much broader audience than you typically would have when you're dealing with building an application inside of your enterprise, for example, okay? And so there's just simply more demand on your server. You have more requests for data than you typically had. I used to design databases or database applications um, in, in the 90s before the web became a thing. And most of the applications that I built had users maybe in the hundreds if I was extremely successful because I was building it, an application that to run inside of a company. And usually it was for my department. And rarely did that ever grow more than 100 people simultaneously. In fact, most of the time, I would be thrilled if five people were using it simultaneously. But that's just simply not the case on the web. On the web, sure, when you're first building your application, that might be the truth. But when you build an application for somebody in your department and the query takes 10 seconds to run, that might be OK. Right? That might be OK. But if you multiply that by 5 or 10 or 100, it's not OK. And when you're dealing with web and you have like an e-commerce site and your users are sitting there waiting, that's definitely not OK. In fact, it used to be that a website that took two to five, even 10 seconds, was kind of acceptable. This is back going back to like 2000 or the 90s. It was kind of acceptable if your website took that long. 
But every year, statistics tell us that for every fraction of a second that your web, your web page takes to load, you are actually losing customers, especially when you have a large numbers of customers. How many of you ever gone to a web page and it just took a while to load you and said, ah, screw it, you just went and did something else? Raise your hand. Okay, look at all those customers you lost, right? So the reality is that the simple fact that you are losing money because your page took too long to load was the main reason why NoSQL came to be. Simple as that. And the reason why NoSQL was a big part of that is because the reason why these pages would take too long to load is that you'd run lots and lots of queries that had joins in them. And joins kill performance. So you do a join between two tables, and that effort of getting those two indexes to line up and work is on an order of magnitude slower than just simply going on one table and looking for records in an index. Okay, an order of magnitude. So it's dramatically slower. Now, <clears throat> um, so once these websites started crashing and they just simply weren't performing, um, that's what they ended up doing. They ended up saying, you know what, screw it. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna denormalize my database. Uh, for those of you who are kind of, maybe don't know what that word means, basically means that instead of storing all of my data efficiently so that it's not duplicated in multiple tables, okay, um, I'm gonna store my data cleanly so that um, <clears throat> maybe all of my um, users and their orders are in two separate tables, and I have a users table, and I have an orders table, and there, I have uh, a one-to-many lookup so I can see that every order has a user ID and I go look up and see the user. Instead, I'm gonna just simply put that all into one table, which means I'm duplicating my user data over and over again for every order where they purchase the second or third or fourth order, right? So I'm just gonna put that into one row, even though the users are duplicated. And that means that when I wanna go find the data, I only have to go find it once by order ID, and then I get all my data. It comes right out, it's fast rather than having to say, oh, uh, let's go get the order ID and all the order details, and I'm gonna go now search for and find the user and then get the user details, okay? So I'm gonna denormalize this, put it all into one row, and now I no longer have a join. So that's where the concept of NoSQL really came from, is I don't wanna have a query across I don't need the SQL part, right? Because SQL is what you is the language you use to write that query. Instead, I just want to have an index. So I suppose they could have just called this um, instead of no SQL, they could have just called it index or big index, and that would have been a good name. But they didn't do that. They came up with no SQL, and the reason why they came up with no SQL is there was a conference that was being organized down in Los Angeles, and Twitter had become a thing, and they were using Twitter to say, hey, what are we gonna talk about in this conference? It was kind of about scaling out your databases. And somebody had said, um, I don't know, but here, let's just use this hashtag, NoSQL, uh, to make sure that we can all find each other's comments on Twitter. That was it. Somebody just put that NoSQL hashtag in their comments, and all of a sudden people are like, yeah, we're talking about NoSQL. What's NoSQL? Oh, well, you get rid of the blah, 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 well, NoSQL. So that's where it came from. It's kind of a dumb name, but it does mean, essentially, I need to scale out my database. And queries are killing me. That's what it basically means. All right, now, um, what, so that was roughly, I don't know, 2000, late 2009 or somewhere in there. And the concept at first was, um, Look, even if I use my uh, MySQL or Postgres, it's still too slow. Now, it could have been just simply a marketing gimmick. Somebody could have said, oh, you know, these databases are too slow, therefore I'm gonna go create this new database. But the reality is these new databases have actually been around for quite a while because the concept of being too slow 
because of the queries is actually not a new concept. That concept has been around for a long time. It's just that you and I would never run into it. It was always in like some sort of high performance database used on Wall Street to you know, calculate information that needed to be uh, used in a trade. Okay, So they had run into this problem long, long, long time ago and said, uh, let's solve these problems. So when the web came out, uh, some of the people who built these databases specifically for this problem said, you know what? I'm going to apply this database, this database problem or solution uh, to the web. So I'm going to bring my technology to the web and we're going to offer it more than, to more people than just the uh, Wall Street folks. So you started seeing these guys come in saying, hey, I've got something to market. I need to call it something. And I don't want to call it big index. I want to call it NoSQL because we're against them. We're going to differentiate ourselves against them. So the concept kind of got it, got marketed. So you could say it was kind of a marketing term by these people over here who were different than the uh, SQL databases. But it did let them uh, focus and specialize on solving that one problem. So you could go get a database, start using it, and all you needed is performance to perhaps look up some information like products or something like that. <clears throat> and its number one job was to be fast and it solved that problem for you and you go, hooray, I love this NoSQL stuff, and we should all use NoSQL. So um, that's kind of how the whole thing got started. And once there was like these databases that solved this problem, we realized something. NoSQL isn't just good for being fast. There's actually another incredibly important benefit to NoSQL. I don't think you'll guess what this is, but I'm going to just ask. Anybody guess what that additional benefit might be? Anybody? It's kind of a long shot. All right. Oh, yes. Oh. Say that again. Yep. You don't need to process it. Okay. I'm going to give you about half credit for that, at least. That's, not, that's about half of the answer I was looking for, okay? Um, what's that? Okay, well, now we, we already have the scalability benefit. Okay, so in addition to the scalability benefit, thank you, though, uh, the other one I'm looking for is no schema. Now, of course, there's a schema, but it's, it's a super simple schema, right? Because if all you have is one giant index, that's all you've got, right, a big giant index, with a row, and you're just reading the data out of that row, there's not much of a schema, right? That's a pretty simple schema, right? So um, no schema, no, not a lot of design going on there. If it's just a big giant index, uh, not much reason to design anything. Just put in whatever data you want, right? Um, so, why do you need a DBA? There's not much of a need for a DBA, really. And so what ends up happening is you don't really worry about database design. As a developer, you just go put whatever you want in that row. And you don't need to go and say, hey, database administrator, I'd like to change something. And you know, then they're going to argue with you. And it might take days, sometimes weeks, for this change to actually occur. All right, no, gone. That whole process disappeared. As a developer, you just simply say, here's the data I want to put in that row, put it there, you're done. No arguing. Okay, maybe people are still arguing, but there was no technical limitation preventing you from just putting the data there. Now, if you were, uh, now that leads us, by the way, to the question of what kind of data are you putting in this NoSQL database, right? Because if you're not putting in your row with an, uh, a, a link to a foreign key in, or to, with a foreign key to another table, what are you doing with the complexities that occur? Okay, so different database company, different NoSQL database companies began to solve these problems in different ways. 
And that's really the main focus of this talk, is really to help you understand that there's different ways to solve this uh, SQL problem. And it really depends on what problem you're trying to solve. So let's start off with the basics. All right. So a very, very simple database like Redis is simply trying to solve the speed problem. That's all it's trying to solve. So every decision the creator of Redis made was always about performance. Always. There is no decision that I know of and no feature of Redis that exists for any other reason than performance. And that is why it is basically the fastest database there is. Now, um, and by the way, I'm not here to just promote Redis. I'm just trying to point, I'm trying to point out the obvious, which is if you're just trying to get performance, go with Redis. All right? It is absolutely ridiculously fast. It's an open source free database. There's no reason why you should ever pay anybody for it if you just want to have one version, you know, one instance of the database. Okay, it's very fast. Now, the way Redis works is that when you put data into a Redis row, just like I was talking about earlier, you just simply tell it the name of every field and the value of every field. That's what you do. Okay, in fact, it actually gets even simpler than that because the default um, format that you put the data into Redis is simply key value. In fact, you, so therefore you don't even choose the field name. It's just whatever that index is that you decide you want to call that value. So is the actual index value. And so you would say something like set <clears throat> foo equal to bar. And foo is now going to be the index value and bar is going to be the value. That's it. So now you say get foo and you get bar back. Just simply doesn't get any easier than that, folks. That is ridiculously easy. Redis goes on to provide you some other uh, more complex data structures inside of Redis. So if you want to have a row with multiple fields, you can do that. You use, uh, you, instead of saying uh, set, um, you would use h set, okay, which is a hash. <clears throat> and then uh, you would pass in the name of every field with the value. So you'd say h set um, foo bar. And then you might say first name Dave, last name Nielsen, okay? So you would actually put in the value, the, the, the name of each field and the value of each field. Therefore, on any given row, a developer can decide what the heck goes in there. Again, no schema, right? Okay? So if we're trying to be as simple as possible and fast, Redis is going to be excellent for you. But it's got some limitations because of that. Um, and I'll come back to Redis because it's a very, I'm going to dive deeper into Redis than I will the other ones just because I know it better. But, uh, but if, if, if you just want simple and fast, that's the way to go. Now, the downside to Redis is it's only in memory. Again, they're making the decision to be fast, always. Every decision that have ever been made is about performance. That's why Redis is so fast. So the data is only in memory. Does that mean it doesn't persist to disk? No, it does persist to disk. It's just that you're going to write to memory and get a response back before it actually writes to disk. So if something were to happen where a crash were to occur, it is possible you could lose some data. You could then recover from the data on disk, but again, the, the focus of Redis is on performance, so it's actually going to write to memory and respond to you before it actually saves that to disk. Is that making sense? So, and Redis is so fast, I forget, the last time I checked, it was close to 2 million operations per second. Okay, that's insane, just so you know. All right, that is ridiculously fast. And there are other databases that can come close, or maybe even beat it on a, you know, per a specific use case. But in general, on all the general use cases, Redis will beat them all. Um, the, uh, 
So another limitation of Redis is that um, it doesn't have a very sophisticated query language, all right? Like you, you, if you're gonna do some sort of query, um, Redis can be fast depending on how you store your data and what you're trying to do with it, but it also could be very slow because if you're trying to write some sort of um, query to get lots of data out. So some of the other NoSQL databases have stored the data or created a database in a slightly different way to solve slightly different problems, okay? So sometimes it's not really about being fast. Sometimes maybe all you wanna do is get rid of the data database administrator. You just wanna give the power to the developer to do it basically whatever they want. Okay, that actually turns out to be a very powerful capability because you can speed up your development faster. And so really the only way to do that is to get rid of the schema. And you still, get some, you still want to have speed, but just giving a developer a very friendly environment where they can build out the applications they want without having complex database changes is, is actually a, a big benefit. You know, have you ever built an application and you have all these queries in your code and it gets kind of complex and all of a sudden you go to change one of the data, maybe you want to take one table and split it out into two and have you ever noticed how messed up that makes the rest of your application? Like how much you have to go through and change? So it turns out there's, data, there's a data, very popular database out there whose primary benefit is not so much speed as it is simply being a NoSQL database that gives you a lot of developer rich features. Anybody know what that database is? MongoDB, you all know that, okay. So, um, MongoDB is probably the most popular. It's not necessarily all that fast. In fact, I would make the argument that Postgres is probably just as fast as MongoDB. About the same, actually. Maybe, maybe plus or minus a little bit, but it's not that different. So why would you use MongoDB over Postgres? It's primarily because when you go to write your data, you're gonna write it to a value, uh, I'm sorry, a, a key. Um, but they've, it's just like, with, uh, as opposed to Redis, they've added, they've made it a little bit easier, okay? So for example, you've got this concept called collections, all right? So you can actually bucket your uh, keys into collections, which means technically you have a little bit of overhead you gotta know which collection are you gonna write to, right? Just a little bit, like, um, uh, but Redis doesn't have that. Redis is like, it's all basically one giant collection. There's no concept of um, some of my data is in this collection, some of my data is in that collection. It's just one giant index because you request a index, uh, a value, you're in and out. With Mongo, you might have just a little bit of extra tiny overhead because you have a little bit of extra way to go to find that key because it's in a collection somewhere. So there's a little bit of extra, but that's done to make it be a little bit easier for a developer, for any user. And in most cases, it doesn't matter. Um, also, when, when you store your data into MongoDB, you're storing your data into uh, a JSON format. And that gives you a lot of flexibility. Okay, because you can put whatever you want in that JSON format. You can actually put, effectively, tables, rows, with other tables of rows, right? Like you can basically structure your data however you want in that JSON format. And your pull, your, and the request to get the data out is gonna be still very fast, right? Because it's just an index value that you go and find, pull that JSON format out, you're done. And then you're gonna let your application do some of the parsing. So the database doesn't get hit as bad. So, and that JSON format turns out to be excellent because a lot of the applications are ba based on uh, RESTful APIs where the format is in JSON. So there's not a lot of translation going on there. Very efficient moving the data in and out of the database. So MongoDB, I mean, if you're, if you're just getting started and you wanna build a, a NoSQL database, um, 
you know, it, it's a very popular database for, for the, basically the reasons I just mentioned. Um, but it's not really all that fast, honestly. Um, so now, uh, I'm gonna give you sort of my punchline. My punchline is basically, um, I would always start off with the database that you like, you feel the most comfortable with. Um, that's probably the most important thing if you're trying to be efficient and get the job done. Because the databases that I've mentioned so far actually uh, can work together very nicely. So if you want to go use, if you already know SQL Server or MySQL or Postgres or any of the SQL based databases and you feel very comfortable with those databases, use them. And the reason why I'm going to say go ahead and do that is because um, if, if you're basically, if you don't have any major reason why to use a different database, if you, once you start running into performance problems, you can always put something like Redis on the front end. Okay, so you can start caching your data that typically will sit in MySQL. You can cache it into Redis. And you will now have the performance that you need with the structure of a database that you feel comfortable with. And Redis is ridiculously easy to use. Get and set, or hget and hset, it's really easy. So once you've started using a database, whether it's MongoDB or it's um, uh, one of the SQL databases, and then at some point you're gonna find something slow, just take that one piece out and put it in Redis, okay? And now all of a sudden you're gonna have the performance that you, that you need. So anyway, that's kind of my punchline. Now let's talk about some of the other databases out there because uh, there, <laughs> there are by far many others out there. Um, so for example, yes? A lot of those people, they are using the memory cache. For example, the MongoDB. Right. They are using, so what is the, I use the MongoDB and memory cache, but what is the difference between I'm using the web cache and the memory Yeah, MongoDB uh, offered the memory cache, I think in the last year, right? That's a relatively new feature. Uh, actually, no, actually before 2 point something. And under the 3.0, actually the MongoDB there is a compression, which is get rid of the memory cache. Right, yeah. so, um, okay, so the, the, the 3.0 with the, the, they actually have the capable of having like a memory server, like separately, okay. Um, so memory cache versus, um, um, uh, something like Redis, there's, there's a little bit of difference, okay, in that, um, first of all, Redis will still be faster than that, right? Um, I personally like the separation of concerns. If you, if you find that you're using MongoDB and the memory cache performs the way you need it to, that's great, try that, right? Um, Redis will still be faster, but maybe the convenience of having it all in one is, is worth it, okay? Um, and by the way, think about this. If, if the problem you're trying to solve is just simply caching the data, a read-only copy of the data, then that may work perfectly fine for you, okay? A lot of folks think about it um, when they're building their databases. They they think, oh, well, I just need to store a copy of the data in memory, and then that's gonna be as fast. And 50% of the time, that's probably true. However, what if you're building something like a, uh, um, a collaborative calendar? And um, you put up some sort of PubSub capability. So a lot of people are interacting with this calendar, or at least most of the cases viewing the calendar. So that's a lot of impact on your server. Um, and it's a write once, read many times, right? Um, and you typically have to set up a workflow once the, once the request comes in, it says I'm gonna add something to the calendar, now everybody else's browsers need to get that update. So now you have to have a subscription. Each browser is subscribed to what they call a channel. 
And that channel is usually built out of a, uh, a set. So Redis just happens to have these data structures that are all built specifically for handling this, these workflows really fast. So I'll get to that in a moment, but the point simply being is if you're just simply reading, then the uh, cache built into the database that you're building or, or using will probably work fine for most of the time. If you truly are worried about performance, um, it might be best to go use something that uh, is built for speed, right? And by the way, like, uh, I, I don't even know the number, but I can roughly guarantee you that of all the highest performing websites out there, they're all using Redis somewhere. So, um, but they're probably using something else for their primary database, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, an example like, like Twitter, Twitter is basically all based on Redis. Because it's far more important for them to have performance than it is for them to save a trillion tweets and not lose anything. Like they might lose a tweet or two, you know, out of a trillion tweets. But is that okay? I think they'd rather, I think we'd all rather have a little bit of a faster experience than, than perfection, right? Um, and that's why a lot of websites have gone is they've started to identify the areas in their website where it doesn't have to be perfect and, and speed is far more important. So you'll see that from time to time. Yes? True. That's true. So uh, the first answer I'll give you is that if you have that type of problem, you might just want to stick with SQL. Seriously. Um, there's, there's no law that says that every use case is better in no SQL. Okay. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in some cases it's not good for transactions, okay? It depends on what you're trying to do. I'll give you an example. So Redis, let's so say if you guys have heard of the CAP theorem, okay, it's uh, consistency, availability, uh, partition uh, tolerance, okay? And the basic premise behind the CAP theorem is that no database can do all three. Okay, that's, that's the idea behind the CAP theorem. It's, CAP, C-A-P, and it's, it's um, consistency, uh, availability, and partition tolerance. So um, yeah, and so you typically will not have a database. It, 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 theoretically, it's impossible for there to be a database that does all three. <coughs> so that's another thing that you should look at when you're trying to decide what kind of database you want. Look for a database, look, de decide what is important to you. Uh, consistency may be important, availability may be important, or partition tolerance may be important. Partition tolerance basically means, uh, you know, if something goes down, did you lose any data, right? High availability basically means uh, I always want a response, all right? So those things are kind of diametrically opposed, kind of, right? Um, and then uh, um, consistency basically says, like, when I write something and somebody else reads something, they better get the same exact thing that I just wrote. Okay? And since these three things are virtually impossible to get, all the databases typically focus on two. And then try to fudge the third. Or try to come close to the third, all right? So, for example, let's pick, um, let's pick, let's pick, uh, well, let's just pick, let's pick Redis, because again, I can speak with this one with somewhat authority. Redis is in memory. Um, so when you write to it, is that information going to be the same information that somebody else gets when they immediately read that same value. So if I write to the foo index and I write 
bar, and somebody else immediately goes and reads foo, are they going to get bar? Actually, with Redis, the answer is yes. Okay, because Redis is focusing on solving this problem. All right. Um, here's the deal. Let's say I write foo. Right, uh, I write foo. I write uh, bar to foo, and then somebody else immediately goes and updates foo. It says bar one, and then I immediately come back in and I read uh, from foo. I am going to get bar one, and here's why. Because Redis is single threaded. Every operation happens after all of the other operations have already completed. So when you go and write to foo, nobody else can get into the side and read foo until you're completely, you've completed writing to it. Okay? Now the problem with this is this is not partition tolerant. Because right? I write to foo, it's on that one server. There's, there's only one server. Okay? With Redis, if you want to be partition tolerant, then what ends up happening, you'd have to mirror that data, and then that data would have to be sent to the copy, and it might take a little while for that to happen. But the way that people use Redis is where there's only one copy at any one point in time of one particular index value. So you're always talking to one server. That's how Redis is used. Okay, now you can set it up other ways, but it's typically there's other databases that do that better. So Redis is excellent for this one problem where you have a lot of different systems interacting with each other, and they're all talking to each other, and you always want to know that whatever your whatever has been written will immediately get the same value from other databases or from other uh, requests. But you have that bottleneck of one server um, handling the data. The good news about Redis is that because it's all in memory, it's extremely fast, and so that one server can handle a heck of a lot. Okay, but if it were to go down, you might lose some data, so it's not partition tolerant in that case. Yes? Yes, you're waiting. It's in memory, and it's all on C. It's extremely fast. So, yeah. Now, there's different ways that that's, they, they've done things to make it a little bit, I don't want to dive too deep into Redis, but I can tell you that the, the, they've, if you're going to write and read, that's extremely fast, okay? If you're going to write, and then it's okay for a while until you get the accurate read, then that's not the best you can do, right? So if you're trying to interact, and like let's say you're doing a real-time bidding system, like you gotta make sure that the bids are all up to date, right? So something like Redis is gonna be able to handle that extremely well. But if you're simply trying to write some, like uh, to Facebook, hey, I've changed my favorite color from blue to red, okay, Redis is overkill for that, because I, you don't care if people see that my change in favorite color is immediate, right? So all having in memory is overkill. Instead, you can write it to any one of the many, you know, hundreds of databases, thousands of databases they have, and it's eventually consistent, and eventually it'll make its way back to the master database, and eventually get pushed back out to all the other thousand databases, and eventually when I read over to this database, I'm gonna see, oh, it's no longer blue, it's red, right? So it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. In the Redis case, it's really about interacting and getting the absolute most up-to-date value. And because it's all in memory, it's extremely fast. It's all single-threaded, so you know that all of the operations ahead have completed, so you know that you're getting the latest value. But um, you have to shard your database because each copy is the only copy. And you don't write to one and then have it update the others. Okay, that's not what Redis is typically used for. You can do that. It's just not typically what Redis is used for. Okay. Now, by the way, 
the way in which Redis will make sure that you don't lose your data, this is the best practices. I'm kind of jumping ahead at this on a slide. <clears throat> um, when you write to Redis, you actually do have a replica. And so you'll write to Redis, it'll respond, but then it'll also send a copy to the replica. So now you have two copies, and the replica will write to disk. So now you have two copies and you have it on disk. But there is a lag, and so at some point, if everything were to crash, you might lose a tiny bit of data. In memory, it's, it never reads from disk. Redis never reads from disk. It's, Redis is, trying, is not trying to be all things to all people. It is just simply trying to be fast. That's all it cares about, okay? So if you have data that you want to be fast and it's not the end of the world if it crashes, Redis is awesome. In fact, I'll tell you, a lot of telcos actually are starting to use Redis because when you're managing all the data about a phone call, if your servers crash, you lose the phone any, phone call anyway, right? So the, the call is going to drop. All the metadata about the call, if you lose that, it's okay, because they're going to dial back in, okay? So if the servers crash, the call is gone anyway. It doesn't matter about all the rest of the data. So what they really want in a phone call situation is all that metadata about the call, the things that make that call connect and all that kind of stuff. They want that to happen as fast as possible because they don't want the delay, right? So they they care far more about performance and availability uh, than they do about like you know losing their data, all right? So Redis is really good for that. MongoDB, MongoDB is going to write to disk and come back, all right? Why? Because in our brains we can handle that much better. So when a developer is first getting started and they hear from Redis, oh, you might lose some data? Wait a minute, what, what data? Like, it paralyzes them because they're like, well, okay, uh, I don't know if that's okay. Like, you know, they, they just, they're so uncertain that it stops them in their tracks and then they don't use Redis. So, um, and they'll go to MongoDB and say, hey, I just heard from Redis, they might lose some data sometime. How about you? Are you gonna lose some data sometime? Nope, we're gonna write to disk and then we're gonna respond. Okay, phew. And then they get to using it and they're like, man, this thing is slow as heck. But at least my data's there, right? So, you know, uh, it, it's a much more comfortable world for a developer when you're first getting started. Yes? Uh, okay, so I can't remember which, if, if it's a cap, cap. Yeah. So let's just get this out from, I don't know it that well. I should know more about it, but, but here's the one, the deal about in-memory SQL, okay, the deal with that is you have to build the, app, the database for SQL for it to work, right? So they've written it to handle SQL. Redis wasn't written for SQL, all right? And what that means is that they'll do things to make SQL faster that may be fast in SQL, but not as fast as Redis might do things. So you get the benefit of SQL, but that still doesn't make it the fastest possible. That's primarily why Redis hasn't done SQL so far, is because it's slower, even in memory. Uh, I wouldn't say that for every use case. I'm sure there's some use cases where having SQL in memory in VaultDB is faster than Redis, but in most cases, going and getting an index and coming back out is gonna be the fastest you can possibly go. So there's, there's you're, you're gonna sacrifice something when you do that. Um, but I'm not gonna trash it for supporting SQL. A lot of people like SQL. So if you want SQL and you want it to be as fast as possible, putting it in memory is probably the way to go, right? So um, it just depends on if you want SQL. I have no idea what time it is. I'm really completely off my presentation. Um, okay, so it's 5.47. I think we got until 6.15. Okay. All right. Sorry, I do this a lot. I get in my presentation, I just kind of listen to what people want to talk about and go. So, <laughs> sorry about this. Um, all right, so how are we doing? We've talked about uh, the SQLs, we've talked about Redis, we've talked about Mongo, we've talked about the CAP theorem. All right, we're about a little hot, over halfway there. All right, let's talk about some of the other databases. How about Cassandra? You guys ever use Cassandra? 
What's Cassandra good for? What's that? Okay, yeah, that's actually a pretty good answer. I would go with that. Uh, distribute, the answer was distributed processing. All right, now, um, first of all, let me tell you how Cassandra got started, because it's kind of interesting. Uh, it actually got started as a database that was called a column family database. Column family. That's kind of odd. Column and then it's family. Well, first of all, what's a column database? Um, so I'm going to do that for a moment because column is kind of interesting. So <clears throat> forget about Cassandra. Let's just talk about column family. Column family database basically means that instead of organizing your data on disk the way it's, sa it's saved as being in rows, it's storing the data on disk in a column. And you might be like, well, what the heck does that mean? When I first heard this, I was like seriously like, Totally confused, right? By the way, can you tell I'm originally from Southern California? Totally. I uh, still have some of that in me. Um, but the, the it, that's confusing, right? Like, what do you mean? Like, why, why does that matter? Or what does that even mean? Like, I'm like, my brain is bent, okay? So what that means, basically, is when you're trying to go find data um, in a row, um, you're looking for it based on some sort of ID, and the ID could be anywhere. So you index that ID. Now you can index that ID in various ways. One way you might index it is you might just simply store the data anywhere and then that, that main column, like the primary key, okay, is stored on disk right in a row. And why is it important to store those, all those bits right, right in a row, or actually in a column, or however you want to put it? It's actually a column, right? So why do you want to store all that index in a column? Because you know that when you go to look for something, the algorithms can be very effective at figuring out where it is the value is. Because it can estimate. It says, oh, okay, here's a number between, uh, I know that the beginning is one and the end is a billion, and I'm looking for 500 million, Oh, that's going to be roughly halfway. Okay, so it's very easy for it to go boom and find roughly where that value is. Okay. When you, oh, and then once it gets there, all the other data, it then jumps over and it finds the the table and it finds that row and all of the row data is stored next to each other. So that you go find the index or whatever, and then you find the row data, and all of it's stored next to each other. Okay, and that's, that's why in the old days you used to have to allocate, here's how long my row is, and here's how much I'm allocating to each row, and it would save that much space on your disk so that when you go and put your data in the row, it's all stored on the disk right next to each other, therefore when the needle or whatever went to go find that, um, that index, it would then just read across and get the entire row quickly. Okay, so if you're optimizing for, I just need to find the index and then read the row, that's your typical, uh, you know, table, table structure. But what if you know for sure that you're just going to read down, and therefore you're never searching, because you just know you're going to start at the top and just read down. You don't really care about saving how much space you're going to save for a row. Okay, because for example, let's say it's a time series database. You know exactly in what order that's going to be written to disk, right? It's not like you're going to go back later on and insert some event late, you know, earlier on, because you're just simply writing one event after another, right? So the whole thing can be basically stored in time series, right? And so then what you do is you put all the columns, uh, store, you store all the columns together. And then the reason why Cassandra is called a, a time series, or I'm sorry, column families, what they do is they, they store the columns all together so that you can just read everything on disk but then they have chunks of it that are stored next to it so you can read part of it. But it's optimized more towards like a 
a time series type of data. So, yes? Only that column, yeah. So like, and a good example would be um, if you're trying to do a, if you're constantly trying to identify um, averages, let's say, or something like that. So you're constantly reading from top to bottom. You don't wanna be searching for each value. You just wanna go put your needle down and read it from top to bottom and read all of the values at one time and there's no searching for values. They're just all stored on disk right next to each other. Right? So that entire column is all stored next to each other. You can get from the top to the bottom as fast as physically possible. And of course, then they'll do some memory mapping things so it'll all be in memory, but in memory, you're just, you're, everything's right next to each other. So it's all extremely fast. It's as fast as you physically can be. That's what the benefit of a column store is. It's kind of like everything's an index. right? Uh, and it's optimized, usually when you're storing data just in a time series, it'll be like that, all right? So uh, that's why all this machine-generated data is often stored in some sort of column uh, family database, okay? It's just like uh, Splunk or, you know, all these uh, <coughs> logs, like that's usually stored in something like that, if you're trying to index it, or uh, I'm sorry, if you're trying to like um, then use it for uh, averages and things like that uh, in the future. Okay, so anyway, Cassandra started off like that, but then they kind of generalized it. So now it's more of a general purpose database, but its primary purpose is, hey, you know what? Something's changed and I wanna push it out. I just wanna capture that it changed. Okay, so I, I'm writing, for example, a blog post. And I wanna save my blog post. And there's people reading my blog post. <clears throat> My blog post doesn't change very often because I wrote it and then I'm probably not gonna change it ever again or maybe I'll edit it sometime in the future. But if I ever make an edit to my blog post, as soon as I hit the save button on that edit, does it have to immediately update and make sure that like nobody after I hit the save button, nobody's reading the old version for about a second? No, it's probably not a big deal, right? So what Cassandra's great at is if I'm writing some data and I want to save, it's great at that eventually consistent stuff. In fact, Facebook created Cassandra and is basically for that reason. So when you go hit save, it's going to go save it to one of the servers and it's eventually going to save it to all the others. And so when you save it to one of the servers, if somebody else is reading, they're probably not gonna see that save for a little bit, okay? So in that case, you can see how Redis and Cassandra are kind of opposites. Redis, you're gonna save it only to one server, not to any other servers, and it's gonna happen immediately. Cassandra is gonna save it to one server and it's gonna eventually trickle out to the other servers. <clears throat> so they kind of have these different purposes. And I would say that they're great complements to each other. So if you're building any sort of like content distribution system, Redis is, or uh, Cassandra's great for that because you can say, okay, write your data, it's gonna eventually get out there. So like a social network or anything like that where um, you know, I, I'm gonna make a change to my favorite thing and it's gonna eventually get out there. And it handles that in, a, in pretty massive scale. So, and you know, anyway, so that's, that's why I think Cassandra is an excellent choice for high scale, publishing of lots of content. Very good for that. It saves it to disk. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, you can scale that out pretty much as wide as you want to go. But if you need the immediate exact answer when something's been changed, probably not the best choice. Okay, did you have your hand up? Oh gosh. I can compare it to Firebase. I don't think I can compare it to Google Data Store. Uh, I, don't, I just don't know enough about how, like what their priorities are. Um, uh, are you talking about Fire, Firebase, right? So Firebase is kind of like Redis, right? I mean, the way it behaves, the difference is it's all a framework and it all works together. So 
Uh, out behind the scenes, I don't know what they're using for Firebase, but it, it kind of behaves the same as Redis. The downside to Firebase is that it, it may do what you want it to do, but it's a framework. So if you start using it and all of a sudden you need to do something different, you may not be able to do that different thing. Uh, but Firebase, just so you know, it's, it's a hosted database in the cloud. You can't download it and run it on your laptop. It's only in the cloud. And it has some nice uh, plugins that you can use for you know, PubSub and real-time chat and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a nice framework for that. And if it works for you, then great. Just be careful because if there's something you need to do and it doesn't do that, you might kind of paint yourself in a corner and you might never be able to do that one thing. Okay. Yeah, so CouchDB is interesting because um, I, I used to know a lot about it, but it's changed over the years and I don't know it quite as well. But uh, Couch is, um, <laughs> so if you're building a mobile app and you want people to be able to write offline, they've got some really nice tools for that. Yeah, really nice tools for that. So. Um, like they ha they literally have a database that runs on your mobile phone, like in addition to the database in the in the you know on the servers, right? And so, um, uh, but they they're, they originally were based on uh, uh, Memcached. So that's I, I, this is where I get a little lost because originally what happened with um, uh, Couchbase is, is it's the merger of two different database companies. Okay, it was originally CouchDB, and it was um, Mem, Mem, Membase. Membase was based on uh, Memcached, and CouchDB was based on, or Couchbase was based on, uh, I'm sorry, it was called like, yeah, well, whatever. It, it, CouchDB is what Couch1, I think is what they were called, was based on. And so it was the merger of these two databases, CouchDB and Mem, Memcache. I think they're mostly memcache now. Yeah, so memcache and Redis are kind of similar. Um, it's just that memcache was originally just one data structure. It was basically a string. And then Couchbase, when they merged, I think they added some features in there. So that's where I get a little lost because I'm not quite sure what all the features are that they added to memcache. So I, th I th you know, I, I'm not speaking with a lot of confidence here. I think I think they have the ability to save the disk before you respond back within Couch uh, Couchbase. I just I can't remember honestly. So, but they were based on Memcache, and then they added this syncing capability to the mobile phone, and that combo is really awesome if you're building a mobile phone. Like a lot of enterprises, really like that. Okay, so. Um, I think they've, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty slick. Um, so a, a lot of companies will buy that. So corporations will buy that. I don't know if it's, if it's many of the web scale companies. I, I just don't know, honestly. But that's kind of where they've got their strength is these two databases working really well together. Yeah. Okay. Um, listen, with the time I have left, um, let me just show you a couple things real quick. So what I wanted to show you, it just to kind of dive deeper onto one database, is different data structures. This is something that um, you know, I can speak to a lot about Redis. I can't get into all the details of the other databases, but it's a really neat concept. And quite frankly, I think we should all know more about these data, different data structures, whether it's Redis or not. Because we don't, as a developer, we don't typically think that, oh, I have different ways and different, different formats I can store my data in a database. Usually you think, oh, I just put my data in the database and I'm done. Well, Redis really focuses on these different data structures. So when you go to save your data, you use one of the 180 functions. So Redis is 100% function based. Whenever you do anything with Redis, you're calling a function and then that function does the work with Redis. And there's 180 of them, so it's a little bit complicated because you have to 
you know, there's so many options of things you can do. Um, but the reality is, like, the, when you're first getting started, you're probably using, like, maybe 20 different functions. That's about it. So it's pretty easy to get started with. But behind each one of these functions is a data structure. And these data structures all have very different purposes. It, it, at the, when you first, at a glance, you're like, uh, this just sounds unnecessarily complicated. And if you don't really care about performance at all, you're right, it is unnecessarily complicated. If you don't care about performance and you just want something simple and easy, go use MongoDB. It's a great database and it's pretty fast. But if you want absolutely the fastest you can imagine, you're gonna wanna learn these data structures, okay? So let me just walk you through them. They're pretty easy. It only takes me, I, I can do this in anywhere from five to 10 minutes um, because some of these you're familiar with already and others you're not. All right, so hold on a second. <clears throat> All right, so the first one, well, here, let me just go through them real quick. So you got strings. The string is key value, that's it. All right, foo, bar, that's it. Bar can be a long string, short string, doesn't matter. A bar can even be a, uh, an image, you know, a binary. It can be anything you want, you just put it in there. And that's super, super fast. That's like as fast as you can possibly get if all you're looking to do is pull something out or put something in, right? Just, that's it, you're done. There's, that's, as, that's all it does. Hashes give you multiple fields for one uh, key, okay? So multiple fields. So you might put, like I said before, a field called foo and a value called bar. You might have foo1, bar1, foo2, bar2, but you're gonna specify the name of each field for every single um, key you have, okay? But a hash, if you wanted to mimic what goes on in a table with all the rows, you'd use a hash. And it kind of behaves the same, except for you have to specify the field names every single time. Uh, oops, I don't need to do that yet. Uh, lists. So list, let's say that all you're trying to do is store a unique list of items. Okay, but you wanna know, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Back up, back up, back up, back up. I skipped ahead. Sorry, let's say all you're trying to do is store a list of items. It doesn't have to be unique. Okay, just a list of items and you don't really care about indexing them. You just simply wanna know the order in which they came. Why do you wanna know the order in which they came? Because you're storing them there temporarily while you have, and you're gonna come back and process them later. So it's kind of a queue, right? In fact, this is where Redis first got its start because um, the creator, uh, uh, Salvatore Sanfilippo, he was trying to use MySQL and it was just too slow. He was trying to accept all these analytics. He just wanted all the, all of the hits to web pages he wanted to dump in there, and it, and it was getting over you know thousands per second, and it, it just couldn't handle all those individual writes, and so he, he created this in-memory cache to handle all the writes, and then he'd get up to like a hundred, you know, a couple thousand, and then he'd dump them into MySQL all at one time, and MySQL could handle that, but it couldn't handle you know thousands of writes per second back then, okay. So he created this list, and all he did is, in memory, he said, okay, I wanna store the order in which they came in. That's all I wanna do. And then with that, I'm gonna store not only the order they came in, but I wanna be able to go backwards. So we call it a double linked list, because with each value is a pointer to the value before and the pointer after. So if, if you're looking at any one particular value, you can always find the value before or the value after. And so you just create this long list, and then what you do is you can pull off the front or you pull off the back. You can add to the front or you can add to the back. And so what you do is you add to the front and it would just kind of push these values along and then you pull off the back, right? And that's how you'd create your message queue. Extremely efficient, extremely fast, all in memory. You really can't get any faster. Okay, sets. <clears throat> sets are what if you want to just simply store a bunch of unique values? That's it, okay? You want a bunch of unique values, but you don't care if they're indexed. Now you might ask, well, why would I want a bunch of unique values that aren't indexed? What if you're creating tags for a product? 
Okay? You want to be able to show the tags for a particular product. Those tags rarely ever need to be indexed. You just want them to be unique. Okay? So you're going to store a bunch of unique value, or I'm sorry, a bunch of yeah, unique values for a product, you know, tags. It's like uh, um, <coughs> we call them folksonomies. You know, it's like uh, people are adding tags. But if they add a tag that somebody already has added, you just overwrite it or just leave it. You're just going to ignore the, the insert, right? So <coughs> sets are very good at letting you throw lots and lots of values out of it and it ignores the duplicates. So when you say write this, add this value, add the color blue to this, um, this set, if blue already exists, it's just going to go, okay. And you're going to go, okay. And you don't really care if it added it because it was already there. You don't really care. Now it's there. That's all you care about. So it's extremely fast. If you're adding like every website visitor to your website and you just want to know the unique users, you want to store the IP addresses, just throw them all in a set. And it's going to ignore the duplicates. That's okay. And it's extremely efficient at that. Can't get any more efficient than that. Okay? Sorted sets are kind of like sets except for there's an extra column to it. So there's actually two values in there. So you're going to get these unique values, just like you get with sets, but you're also going to get with each value an order. So you might have, um, uh, I don't know, a bunch of IP addresses, but you might also keep a timestamp in there. And now you'll know exactly, you'll actually have sort of a column-based uh, data set in there, right? Which you know that's all sorted by timestamp. And then you can go and read that very quickly in the order in which it came in, all right? But it's also unique. So if you keep throwing in uh, new IP addresses, it's just going to ignore <coughs> all the duplicates. And so you can, if, if you wanted to, you can either ignore it and keep the original timestamp, or you can accept it and now you have the new timestamp. So it's, you know, you, and it's going to change however you're, uh, the timestamps are. So uh, sorted sets are absolutely incredibly popular in games where you're keeping a real-time score. Because what you have is you have the user ID and their current score. The user ID isn't changing, the score is changing all the time. So you might have like one of these massively multiplayer online role-playing games where you have like, you know, 100,000 simultaneous users and our scores are constantly changing Redis is pretty much the only thing that can handle that, all right? So <clears throat> uh, that's a sorted set. Bit array, bit array is really cool but kind of obscure. It's literally like a, uh, a, an, uh, a key and then a whole bunch of ones and zeros. So it's a big, giant, long list of ones and zeros. And you might say, well, what the heck is that useful for? Well, you can do all sorts of cool statistical counting things. Um, uh, it's really, really, that's where like you get into being like a math wizard and you might want to track things like uh, how many times a particular word appears in a big long list and you can store them in bits. It's, I don't even want to get into how they do it, but there's libraries that will use this and then they can, in a very efficient way, store uh, information uh, in a very short um amount of space. However, I'll give you a really practical use case. So uh, Pinterest uses BitArray, and what they do is they say, um, I'm going to store the on or offline status for all 200 million users in one key, or yeah, one key. And you're like, what? How are they going to do that? Because user ID 1 is the first bit. And it's either on or off. User ID 2 is the second bit. And it's either on or off. User ID 3 is the second, third bit. And it's on or off. And so in 200 million bits, they can actually store the on or offline status of all 200 million users. And so when you log in and, you, and, and the system wants to know your top 20 or 50 whatever favorite friends, because it'll show the green or red button there, you know, whether they're on or offline, it just go passes 
50 names or 50 uh, IDs into this bit array and it gets them right back. And it's extremely efficient. So they have that all on one server. Pretty cool, huh? Um, <clears throat> Hyper log log is, um, is kind of based on the bit array and this is one of those examples where you can do like some mathematical operations. I don't even really know how it works exactly. But um, the cool use case here is, you ever, if you typed in Redis into Google and you said how many times the word, or you want to see all the web pages that come back and have the word Redis in them, okay? You ever see that little number somewhere that says this word appears such and such million times? You ever seen that? So with Redis, last time I checked, it was like 15,400,000. But it was literally 400,000, so it's like five zeros. Do you think it's really five zeros? Do you think it's that accurate? No. What's happening is they're storing it in something like a hyperloglog, log, which is based on something like a bit array, where they're flipping all these little bits and what they're doing is they're crunching down all of this data, so like literally terabytes of data into like 12K. And it's all a statistical counting me method that they've used these bits for. I, I don't understand it, honestly. But you can store a massive amount of data statistically in these bits and then go ask the bits, how many times does this word appear? And based on its indexing process, it will estimate that. It's like magic. It's like a sampling, yeah. And it stores it all in this hyper, it uses this hyper log log function. And then, so Google basically says, how many times? And it comes back with a number, 15,400,000, and it just displays that to you. And nobody ever goes, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> how are you gonna know? Seriously, you're not gonna know. It's just a rough estimate and it's good enough, right? So if, that's ever, if you ever need that, that's what that function's for. And finally, I'll end up with geospatial indexes. Geospatial indexes is um, kind of what it sounds like. It's a newer data structure, and it's, uh, it's basically the ability to find um, locations near a, a location. So you feed it a location, and it will look through um, uh, uh, you know, a collection of data, and it'll come back and say, um, uh, you know, here's all the values that are within a particular radius of the, of the location you gave me, right? And so the way it stores that, by the way, is in a uh, sorted set data structure. So your collection will be like stores, and then it'll have um, store name and location. That's how it's doing. The location is actually stored in what we call a geohash, which is a different way of storing, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of storing latitude and longitude, which are two values, a geohash is able to store in one value, okay? It's like a different way of doing geohashing. And then geohashes, um, what's cool about geohashes is, is that locations near each other have very similar, pre the first values are all the, it's the same and it's only the last values that are different. So it ends up storing them in the sorted set near each other. And so Redis is able to use that geohash to then find um, all the value, all the stores that are near each other very, very quickly. And so that's how the geo index works. Uh, there's a, a function that is able to translate latitude and longitude to geohash and back and forth. So that's how uh, they do that. But it's basically all the libraries that you need to do geospatial stuff sitting on top of a sorted set. And so the last thing I'll share with you is that um, one of the new things about Redis is this is coming out. It's actually in beta right now. Is the concept of a module. And so Redis is. Um, it's kind of for the, 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 the performance geek, honestly. So, uh, but you're gonna be able to create your own data structure. Okay, so Redis module gives you the ability to create your own data structure. And what'll basically happen is, you got the concept of a string, hash, list, set, and sorted set, and bit array. These are all fundamentally unique data structures. They store the data in a certain way for, to solve a specific problem. Hyperloglog log basically sits on top of a bit array. Geospatial index basically sits on top of sorted sets. And they finally is like, well, enough of this. We can keep going on creating all these data structures for you that's sitting on these primitive data structures, but why don't we give you the ability to do that? Okay, so that's a new thing that's coming out. It's uh, gonna be out late this year. 
Um, and, you know, again, Redis is really just all about performance. That's really all it is. But if you know of a use case where performance matters, you can actually create a data structure and become famous. I'm not joking. Like, that's, that's a world that into and of itself, um, there's already people building data structures for things that make a lot of sense. For, uh, let me ask you guys, what would be a, a data structure that would be kind of fun or actually valuable to build? Or a module, I always say, that maybe sits on one of these data structures. What's that? Search. A search tree, like a, 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 um, binary. a binary search tree. Okay, that might have a lot of practical uses. Um, what's a good example of why you might want to do that? Okay, like maybe like 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 looking at photos or something like that, or like unique binaries. Is that is that is that? Okay. Um, that could be a good one. I, I have to learn more about that to see understand the practicality of that. But I mean, the popularity of that it might be very popular, it might not be. I'm not sure. Um, think about all the data science algorithms. You could build some pretty common algorithms and put this in, in Redis, and, and it'd be the fastest um, model, let's say, for data science possible. And it's all in memory. Yes? Yes, actually, that would be super popular, right? I mean, there's a lot of those things that uh, um, uh, it'd be the fastest possible. That'd be like a, an algorithm that you're creating your own custom algorithm, basically. Um, another one. Weird. Okay. What's that? Yeah, you could do all this kind of stuff, and it would be extremely fast, right? And maybe not as fast as doing it on 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 chip, you know, in the in the CPU. But if you wanted to do a like a software neural network, you could. Um, another thing is uh, just simple um, uh, bidding process, stock market. Um, uh, uh, real-time bidding for ads. I mean, these are all things that you need to have like quick interactivity, right? Um, so bidding, anything where there's that kind of thing going on. Um, how about how about uh, bitcoins? Right, Bitcoin processing. Okay, you can do that in one of these. So anyway, uh, I just want to leave you with the, the kind of the possibilities are really endless with Redis is because of that. Um, all the other databases have their values too, like I mentioned. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if I've left anything out. I think I've covered most everything I meant to talk about. 